Morning. Good to see you. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for leading us uh, in worship and singing about Christ and Him crucified. We come now uh, in our journey through the Gospel of Mark to a portion of Scripture that without there is no Christian faith. It is a passage describing that which 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 explicitly says is a message of first importance. That Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins. And so without this event, there simply is no faith and there is no salvation. And here lies the very epicenter of our faith. Not the cross, but the one who hung upon the cross. Making atonement for our sins as our substitute. And over the decades, centuries really, there has really had to be continually words added theologically to describe Christ's work upon the cross because of the constant need to defend attacks upon Christ's work upon the cross. And that's why we have over many years as conservative, reformed, evangelical brethren, had to come up with the term penal substitutionary atonement. So as to contend earnestly for the faith, just as Jude calls us to do, against the attacks and against the cross, the attacks against the cross of Christ. And so we come to a very important theme in our journey in Mark If you're visiting with us, we're working our way verse by verse through this gospel. And we arrive now at a very important theme, Christ and Him crucified. And we arrive here very much on the heels of and very much in the midst of Jesus' immense suffering, mistreatment, mockery, unjust trials and suffering. He truly is right here as he was prophesied to be, he is the man of sorrows. He is the man acquainted with grief, who has pushed ahead through all of this, all alone in his human frailty, enduring it all in his humanity, so as to be a substitute that is just like us. If at any point in all that we've been studying, if at any point in the process... From the Garden of Gethsemane all the way through to the betrayal and the arrests and the trials. If at any point Jesus used his divinity to endure or advance or escape, then we would not have a substitute just like us, but one unlike us. And so in his human frailty, Jesus is enduring all this because he needed to be just like us in order to save us. And he yet is obviously without Sin And so, truly human, still all while truly God, Jesus pressed ahead, unjustly sentenced, mercilessly beaten, and handed over. Handed over, remember, according to Acts chapter 2 verse 23, handed over according to and by the predetermined plan of God. And so as we walk through this passage this morning, I want you to keep the words of uh, arguably one of the finest, if not the finest minds the world has ever been blessed with, the pastor, theologian, and Puritan John Owen, who said, quote, study Christ more and the things of Christ, delight more in the hearing and preaching of Christ. He is our best friend. And so this morning we look at now and we arrive at the culmination, if you will, of his sufferings as the holy, spotless lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is slain. And so let's read our passage together and then ask the Lord to bless our time in his word. We are in Mark chapter 
15, and we'll begin reading there in verse 22. Then they brought him, that's Jesus, to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And he was numbered with transgressors. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! Huh, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and realize that what we have just read is is immense. We've just read half of it. There's more to come through to verse 41. And so, Lord, as we journey through this halfway section of the crucifixion, would you please aid us and bless us, help us. We believe in the Holy Spirit of God and we pray, Lord, that he would move mightily among us, that he would aid, illuminate, guide and teach us even in this very moment. So, Lord, we've come, we've sung of the cross, we've sung of the one who hung upon the cross, and we want to now continue to worship you, and we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, the world, and even the professing church, makes a lot of noise. A lot of noise. Whether it's political noise outside the church, whether it's seeking to remedy every societal ill inside the church, there's a lot of noise. All over the place. And what we've just read turns the volume down. And it must turn the volume down. It's important that our hearts and minds are realigned with what we are called to be. Theologians of the cross as we saw in recent weeks, and people of Christ. And so let this settle and silence and turn the volume down on all the noise. I want you to see, beginning in verses 22 to 25, number one, a divine fulfillment. A divine fulfillment. Now we know from verse 21 that we saw last Sunday that this man, Simon of Cyrene, he carried Jesus' cross for him. The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus began to carry it and then Simon of Cyrene carried it. Verse 22 tells us that they arrived at this place called Golgotha. Golgotha is Aramaic and as verse 22 tells us, it means place of a skull. Now, you may wonder why we sing and speak as Christians of a place called Calvary. When there really is no mention of Calvary in the Bible. And yet the reason we speak of Calvary is because it comes from the Latin word culva, which means skull. And so in the Latin Vulgate, which is where you get the King James Version from... The Latin Vulgate, Calva, then became Calvaria. And so on this site named Golgotha is where we use the term Calvary, if you're wondering. Jesus now arrives at Golgotha, the place of the skull. He arrives beaten, horrifically scourged, as we've seen, with Simon carrying the patibulum, the crossbeam, you remember. And Jesus doesn't carry the cross, as it were. He carries the beam all the way, 
Simon carries it for him. And as we arrive here, there's many things that can be said about the cross. We could do an entire series about what took place on the cross, on the intent of what took place on the cross, on the extent of what took place on the cross, of the nature of what took place on the cross. And I think we probably should. It's so vitally important. Yet for now and this morning, as, we, as I mentioned in prayer, this is just the first half, what we're looking at this morning of the crucifixion. It runs all the way through to verse 41, but we'll look up to verse 32 this morning. We need to look at what Mark wants us to, sh- to, to see here. Mark, perhaps, like more than any other gospel, is wanting us to show, show us that Jesus is indeed the suffering servant of Yahweh and that as that suffering servant here on the cross and leading up to it, he is fulfilling the prophetic plan of Yahweh, the one true God. From from his birth in Bethlehem all through his life, Jesus has been the very fulfillment of prophecy time and time again. I mean, think about it. As he entered into Jerusalem, For this final time, on his way to suffer and die, he was fulfilling prophecy. Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. That will come about as a result of his work upon the cross. He's humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And so he fulfills scripture as he enters. The crowds that we have seen who first sung songs for him would then during the trials sing songs of murder for him. That in and of itself is a fulfillment of prophecy. It was his own people there at these trials, the Jewish people who were calling out for his death By crucifixion upon the cross, Isaiah 53 verse 3 says, He was despised and forsaken of men, of his kinsmen, of his people. He truly did come to his own, as we read in 1 John, and his own did not receive him. That's a fulfillment of prophecy. We saw Jesus silent before Pilate multiple times, giving no answer. That obviously too was divine fulfillment of divine prophecy. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says he did not open his mouth. We've read that a couple of times. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers he is silent. So he did not open his mouth. And now here he is, silent as he stood. He is now silent as he stands about to be crucified. He is fulfilling prophecy with almost every action and every word. And so too are the people involved. Look at verse 23. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. When you survey all four Gospels, we learn that Jesus was offered twice drink during all of this. Once just before he hung up on the cross and then the second time while he was hanging on the cross. The first time we see here in verse 23, Jesus said no to it. Matthew says that he tasted it, but didn't take it. So he would have tasted it, identified that it was the type of wine that it was, and I'll explain why that's significant in just a moment. But he didn't take of it. He, he had none of it. The drink that Jesus did take, look at verse 36. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink. Notable New Testament commentator William Lane points out that wine and myrrh was first offered to Jesus. This was the wine. We've mentioned this in times past by way of reminder. This was the wine that was made by the Jewish women, and it was given to the criminal who was about to be crucified so as to numb the pain. And the effects of the crucifixion. That is, it was given to make the experience not so bad. In verse 23, Jesus said no to that wine. But he said yes to the sour wine in verse 36. 
That wine was given to him on a hyssop branch. That was the same wine in verse 36 that was given to workers. It was given to soldiers. It was given to invigorate them and revive them. And so Jesus says no there in verse 23 to that which would take away the suffering and numb the pain like an opioid or or the like would. And then he says yes to the wine that would keep him alive later on during the crucifixion that would keep him alive longer. Fascinating. Other criminals would, who were about to be crucified would, would have drank down that first wine to escape it all, to escape the anguish and the pain. But our Savior, the Lord Jesus, instead of numbing the agony, endured the agony. And did so out of His abundant and indescribable, sacrificial, overwhelming love. This too, here, is divine fulfillment of prophecy. Psalm 69 verse 21 says, now think about this. Psalm 69 verse 21 says, written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus ever came to earth, before they even had the concept of crucifixion in their hearts and minds. David writes this. They also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Every detail, every detail filling in God's divine plan, filling in God's prophetic timetable. Jesus passes on that narcotic, numbing drink. He marches ahead. Remember, he is not only the lamb of God slain, he is the priest presenting the lamb. He must be a perfect spotless lamb and also our great high priest. Himself actively as both. And then Mark says, with a brevity that is almost shocking, beginning in verse 24, after saying no to the wine, and they crucified him. There it is. They crucified him. In those four words is found the sum and summation of redemptive history. D. Edmund Hibbert remarked here on verse 24 in his commentary, quote, There is not a single word of description of the physical agonies involved. End quote. You would think, being the most horrific way to be killed, that there would be even a hint of a description or a graphic explanation of this event. But Mark, nor the other gospel writers, spend a moment going into the physical agonies. And yet, oh how many a preacher does Lengthy discourses on the physical damage and the effects and the disturbing details of all that constituted death by crucifixion. Mark and the gospel writers don't at all. Why? Because the physical agonies are not the point. If you ever hear someone preach on the crucifixion, a 45-minute sermon, all about the graphic details about what happens to the body, they have totally missed the point. There were 40 to 50,000 other people killed by crucifixion. It's not the physical agony that God wants us to dwell on. He doesn't want our minds and our hearts to dwell upon the physical agony of Jesus on the cross because that is not what makes Christ's death unique. Because only Jesus' death on the cross, and this is what makes it unique, 
Only Jesus' death on the cross was a sacrifice for sin. And because Jesus' death was substitutionary in nature, and what I mean by that is that just as Jesus said of himself, again divine fulfillment, he said of himself in Mark 10.45 that he came to serve, not to be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many, that is, his paying for the ransom meant that God's wrath was linked to his death. And the reason there was wrath was because there was the imputation of our sin, not infused into him, for he was always sinless, but our sin, understand this, our sin was what merited or earned his punishment in our place, substitutionary. And so Jesus on the cross, in our place, as our substitute, is less about the physical agony he endured, as horrific as it was, and more about what made the crucifixion, his crucifixion, unique. And that was that he bore the wrath of God, not just the nails. Jesus Suffering on the cross here is what is called expiatory, meaning that it is an atonement for guilt, whereby on the cross, Jesus dies as the just for the unjust, the great exchange of the holy for the unholy, of the sinless for the sinful, all with the purpose of bringing us to God. Because our sin had separated us from God. But because the shed blood that took place on the cross of Jesus' blood, where He was our substitute and sacrifice, He took away our sins by taking them upon Himself. And how did He take them? They weren't infused into Him. How did he take them? He took them by absorbing the full wrath of God by drinking down the full cup of God's wrath against sin. Meaning that for everyone for whom Christ died, he took their punishment. So in the spiritual world that we cannot see here, Christ endured not just nail-pierced hands and feet, but the punishment and the wrath of a holy God against sin. And it was the punishment and wrath for the myriads upon myriads of people for whom Christ died. Those that He called His sheep. Those that He called His Church, divine fulfillment on the cross. Look now at the rest of verse 24. They divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. Another prophecy fulfilled here, another divine fulfillment. When you read Psalm 22, you read of a righteous man who suffered. And here now, at the foot of the cross, is the conversation among these Roman soldiers, and they are revealing exactly who this righteous man of Psalm 22 is. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. What happened here, according to John, who gives a fuller account, is that Jesus' garments consisted of four pieces. It included belt and sandal. And so they divided those up among them. And then John tells us that it was among four soldiers. Four soldiers stood watch uh, from each person who was crucified. And when it came to Jesus' garments, they divided them up. And when it came to the tunic, that's the outer cloak garment... They saw there that it's one piece. John tells us that it was seamless. 
pretty special. And so instead of tearing that apart, they cast lots for it with something akin to what we'd call dice today. And so these men at the foot of the cross here, as they cast lots and divide up Jesus' garments, they are totally unaware that they themselves are fulfilling divine prophecy. There is the convergence of so much here. So much is happening in and around the happenings of the cross. And premiered all of that is the substitutionary atonement of the believer's sin. Mark then gives us a time stamp there in verse 25. He says it was the third hour when they crucified him. If you read John 19 verse 14, it says that it was about the sixth hour. And here, skeptics, they get all excited. They say, look, look, contradiction, they say. But, but no, as with any seeming contradiction, antimony in the Bible, it can always be explained away by study. Because here, Mark is calculating time from a Jewish tradition. And John, in his gospel, is calculating time from a Roman tradition. And so John says it was 6 a.m. because he started counting the day from midnight. Whereas Mark used the Jewish way, which was to count the day from sunrise. And so the reason you still end up, though, with three hours difference is because John counts from when all the trials began... And all the mockery and all the beatings and the scourging at 6 a.m., that's when John begins. Whereas Mark simply states that after those three hours of trial and mockery, they crucified him at 9 a.m., the third hour. 9 a.m., Psalm 22, verse 16, dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. And again, Psalm 22, written before they even had comprehension of crucifixion. Psalm 22, verse 16. Band of evildoers has compassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. 9 a.m., the third hour, Isaiah 53, verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him and by His stripes we are healed. We're all like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. I need you to understand that in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and Zechariah 12.10, there was no concept of crucifixion. But here, in divine prophecy and divine fulfillment, collide. At 9 a.m., the third hour, an hour that Jewish people will come in the days still to come. They'll look back and say in divine fulfillment of Zechariah 12.10, which says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, that's all of Israel, the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. So much divine fulfillment taking place here. And Mark wants us to grasp it. I mean, let that sink in that they had no concept of crucifixion. And they're writing about it. That's prophecy. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you've got to do something with that. So much fulfilled. Also, more fulfillment. Jesus said just the night before, didn't he, that the new covenant would be ushered in with all its promises that were promised long ago. He promised that the new covenant would be ushered in. How? As his blood is shed. And so that too was divine fulfillment. That's what I want you to see first. Now, I want you to turn your attention to also what's going on here. And that is number two, a deplorable crowd in verses 26 to 32. Look at verse 26 with me. The inscription of the charge against him said, the king of the Jews. It was the practice of the Romans with each and every crucifixion to write on the name of the, above the person condemned, 
as well as the reason for their condemnation on a wooden placard above their head. The, their name and their reason for their condemnation. Mark is the sole gospel that explains the reason for Jesus' death. The so-called reason. Treason. It says they're the king of the Jews. John 19 verse 19 tells us that Pilate wrote these words. And that Pilate also included Jesus the Nazarene. Remember from our study that Pilate simply could not stand the Jews. And so he here took great pleasure, no doubt, in mocking them by stating, look, here is your king. Here is your king. We say Caesar is king. You say you have a king. And look, here is your king. What Pilate didn't know He didn't know that what he was actually doing was giving a true title to the true king of kings. Verse 27 says that Pilate had two robbers crucified with him, with Jesus. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Interesting, the wording, one on his right and one on his left, you remember the disciples used to argue that they want to sit on his right and his left? Well, those disciples that were arguing that, no doubt are observing this. Is that really where you want to go? There's a high cost to follow Jesus. We know little to nothing about these two men, these two robbers. That's just the reality of it. Some want to say that they were charged with treason too. We really don't know. But the same word for robber was used to describe Barabbas. And so what they had done was indeed serious. They weren't simply just petty thefts. They, they'd done something serious. Much can be said about these two robbers, for they spoke many words while on the cross. But a study of that will have to wait. Verse 28 says that the scripture was fulfilled there. And he was numbered among the transgressors. But I hope in your Bible that verse is in brackets. Because that verse is most likely, most certainly, I would even add, not actually part of Mark's gospel. It was in none of the earliest manuscripts. And it really serves, and I like this, it serves as an introduction to the last 12 verses of Mark. Mark chapter 16. Because they weren't in the earliest manuscripts either. And we may touch on all of that. I'm not entirely sure. But this verse here, verse 28 is not in the original earliest manuscripts. But regardless, regardless of that's there or not, this is indeed another divine fulfillment because the reality of Isaiah 53 verse 12 says, he was numbered with the transgressors. Here, right? And so... You have this deplorable crowd that begins with a deplorable pilot who's writing from a deplorable heart, mocking the king of the Jews. You have the two robbers, one of which, according to Luke 23 verse 29 says, that he was yelling deplorable things at Jesus. He was also joining in the mocking. I mean, verse 32 says at the end of there, they who were crucified with him were also insulting him. And so just a deplorable crowd those that are hanging either side and those that are down on the ground. And now in verse 29 of Mark 15, we see the rest of the crowd now joining in with the mockery of Pilate and those upon the cross. They, verse 29, those passing by were hurling abuse at him. Hurling abuse. Verse 30, they were saying, save yourself and come down from the cross. They were wagging their heads, verse 29, saying, huh, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. You remember that phrase was the phrase that they used to initiate the, the crucifixion. They bribed them to, to, to misconstrue those words. And Caiaphas, we saw the high priest, jumped upon that. There's just this... Pitiful display of deplorable mocking 
I want you to understand that that mockery right there is again divine fulfillment. Psalm 22 verse 7 says this, All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip and get this, they wag their heads. Saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let Him deliver Him. Remarkable. Verse 31. Now the Sanhedrin join in. Verse 31, in the same way the chief priests and also the scribes were, were mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Jesus, if you've been journeying with us through the Gospel of Mark, particularly chapter 14 onwards, Jesus has endured repeated mockery. Each part of his trial included prolonged mockery and mistreatment. And now, at the foot of the cross, all the groups together now are, are there together. They're passing by. They're hurling abuse as He hung upon the cross. This is Mark's account of the crucifixion. No focus on physical agony. Much focus Upon the mistreatment and ridicule. Verse 32. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. This is all such an ugly, ugly scene. And as we've seen, and here again now, Jesus is embracing all the ugly. And He is enduring all the rejection. So that as a result, you and I would be seen as beautiful by God. And instead of being rejected, we would be accepted by God. Beautiful as we are clothed in His righteousness that He earned as a result of His active obedience to the Father's will. And washed clean, white as snow, cleansed by His blood that was shed right here on the cross. I, I want to take just a moment as we draw to a close on this first portion of the crucifixion and talk just a little bit about the atonement. Because in those words, in verse 24 in the beginning, and they crucified Him, is the atonement. I've mentioned already that this was a penal, substitutionary atonement. It was penal because Jesus suffered the penalty for sin, and it was substitutionary because Jesus was our substitute. Another aspect to consider in this whole concept of atonement is the reconciliation that the cross brought about. You see, because of sin, man is alienated and separated from God, and he is only an object of God's wrath. Yet when Christ atoned for sins on the cross, he reconciled, he not only paid the penalty and washed clean, he reconciled man to holy God because the guilt and the punishment had been dealt with. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 says, While we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 16 says, That Jesus might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So it's more than just being forgiven and washed clean. And going from guilty to not guilty. 
It's also being reconciled. And so the cross atones for the penalty and guilt of sin. The cross removes the hostility and brings about reconciliation and peace between God and the believer. And as we consider Christ and Him crucified, there is another thing to dwell upon. And it is this. As Jesus hung upon this cross, and as He bowed on His way to the cross, to the Father's will, fulfilling that which was planned in eternity past, which I would say, by God's sovereign hand, we had read to us twice this morning, Ephesians chapter 1. God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. It was almost like God said when Mike first read it, hey, that's once, but you need to hear it twice, and then Paul led us in communion with it. We need to hear that before the foundation of the world, redemption was planned. And here now, at the cross, redemption is accomplished. It'll then be applied in regeneration and justification and adoption. But here now, salvation is accomplished. And I need you to understand this. That Jesus here upon the cross did not die in some vague way. Some vague way so as to purchase some type of savability contingent upon whether someone chooses to believe in him or not no 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 not one drop of Jesus' blood was shed in vain he did not die to purchase some type of vague savability here at the cross he took names to the cross Jesus said more than once, I have come to do the will of him who sent me. Talking about the active laying down of his life, going through all the rejection and placing himself on the cross to be crucified as not only the lamb of God, but the priest who presents the lamb. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 18, this commandment I received From my father. This commandment. To do this. It was his father who sent him to the cross. To fulfill what was planned in eternity past. Namely that before the foundation of the world. The father gave a people to the son. And the son then fulfills that divine plan. By the father. By dying for them. In their place. As their substitute. So clear is this. These are not my words. These are Jesus' words. Because all through John chapter 6. And all through John chapter 8. Jesus says time and time again. That of all those whom he has given me. I will die for. And I will raise them up and lose none of them. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Those given to him by the father. Now if you think that's a, if you think, if you think, if you think that's a theological stretch and you're throwing a theological framework upon the text of scripture, no, 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 I, I, I beg you not. John chapter 6 verse 37 says, All that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will not cast out. There is a people in eternity past, given by the Father to the Son. And here, on the cross, when it says they crucified Him, He atoned for those people. Jesus doesn't die here in some kind of potential way. He dies here in a most definite way. Atoning for His people. This was the very reason that He was born into the world. This is what was declared at his birth. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. You shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. So as we think about the cross and all that we've looked at, 
And all that we've just heard, what are we to do? What are we to do? Well, as the cross and the Christ of the cross, who out of his love willingly and actively went there, presented himself there, and hung upon there to die, that the believer might live eternally at peace with God, forgiveness of sins, I think we would be, I think we would do well to be humbled and silenced in doing nothing else other than glorying in the cross. What does that mean? How do we do that? Well, here at the cross, as Jesus died, is, as I said, the very accomplishment of our redemption. It was planned in eternity past, but here now, in space and time, the accomplishment here on the cross takes place. Here at the cross is the plan of redemption and the very mission of Jesus colliding to bring about eternal life for all those who believe. And it is here at the cross that man who is unable to save himself is saved by something outside of himself, meaning that there is nothing else to glory in, that is, there is nothing else to boast in but the cross. That when you and I go to glory, eternal glory, we can truly say, Hallelujah. What a Savior. Do you know that Savior? I mean, do you know Him? Do you have a relationship with Him? Has He so impacted your life that your life has been altered? He's the good shepherd. And if you come to him, you'll have the forgiveness of sins, peace with God, eternal life. But more than those, he will be your best friend. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and say thank you for this opportunity to be here. As we can dive in and we, as we wade out into the waters of the crucifixion, the account in this precious gospel, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God. We believe in the Holy Spirit of God and we pray that you would take these words, the words of truth, and plant them deep inside our heart. May we rejoice and may we praise you. May we do the one thing that we can do and only do in light of what we've heard, and that is to say, hallelujah, what a savior. Amen.